Hey everybody, Dr. Retzik here with you. This is our second video in section 7D. Our goal today is to prove the polar decomposition theorem. Let's get started. So in C, we've observed that if you take a non-zero complex number, Z, and you scale it by its own magnitude and then multiply by that magnitude, you have this algebraic equality where you're viewing the number in the parentheses as a complex number that's on the unit circle and you're viewing the second term, absolute value Z, as a number on the positive real axis, same distance from the origin that Z was. So it's almost as if Z got kind of rotated down to land on that positive real axis. Now, if you write magnitude Z in that second term as square root of Z bar Z, then it fits into our analogy between the complex plane and the linear operators on V. Z bar, remember, is analogous to conjugation of the operator. So what you see right there is any random number from the complex plane, Z, can be written as a unit circle thing times a positive square root thing. And this leads us to an educated guess as to the analogous truth for operators on V. So we have this analogy that we've been developing. And its statement is what we call the polar decomposition theorem. And it's a beautiful theorem in the sense that there are no hypotheses at all. So suppose T is a linear operator on V period, you know, and you read that and you think, so what, it's like normal or something or, or positive or it's, a, it's an isometry or, or what, self-adjoint? No, nothing, nothing at all about T. So T is just a linear operator on V. V is a finite dimensional inner product space. That's it. Then there exists an isometry S acting on V such that your arbitrary operator T about which you know nothing is just S times the positive square root of t star t. Okay, so let's, let's keep our analogy strong here. That piece right there, that's the isometry piece. It corresponds up here to the unit circle piece. This right here this is our positive square root piece.
it corresponds up here to our positive square root piece. Now, in the statement of the polar decomposition theorem, we have to make sure we really know what we're talking about with that second piece. So let's expand a little on that. This is the positive square root of the operator t star t. V, because t star t is a positive operator, and we know positive operators have unique square roots. So for any of this to make sense, you have to have in the back of your mind that t star t is itself a positive operator, which you should confirm. It's obviously self-adjoint because that's how starring works. And if you do t star t v inner product v, swing the t into the second slot, you just get the square of the norm of t v. So it's positive. Okay. So all of that is the statement of our analogy to how you can decompose a complex number into a unit circle piece and a positive square root piece. This says you can decompose an operator t into an isometry piece and a positive square root piece. That's the statement. Now, the proof has lots of parts. It's kind of a tour de force of things we already know. And it's got some classic moves in it. So let's see how much of this proof we can work out. You guys may fill in details as you read in the book. All right, here's the proof. Uh, suppose T is a linear operator on V. I just love it, it's so clean. Nothing else to it, that's our only supposition. Okay, so what that means is this picture. It means T maps V to V. Now this operator root t star t also maps v to v. These two operators are not the same map. There's no reason to think that. I mean, root t star t, that operator's positive, and we don't know anything about t itself. These are literally not the same map. Now, we hope that despite not being the same map, they are nearly the same map in the sense that if you follow root t star t with an isometry, you just get t. So we're hoping, all right, fine, they're not exactly the same, but, but they're off by an isometry. Okay. Now, an important observation that kicks off this entire thing is to notice that even though t and root t star t are not the same map, if you take a v and you do t to it, and you take that same v, and you do root t star t to it, there's no reason you get the same thing. I tried to draw the outputs in totally different locations in the box. Like tv's kind of in the middle, and 
root T star TV ended up down at the bottom. They are not the same. There's no reason to believe they're the same. But if you look at the norm of TV squared, as we do, which is TV inner product itself, which is T star T V inner product V, which is root T star T root T star T V inner product V. And don't think that last thing was anything fancy. It's not. Remember what this symbol means. That symbol stands for the unique positive operator that if you do it twice in a row, you get T star T. So that's all we did. We just did that operator twice in a row, and that equals T star T. Nothing fancy there. But remember, this is the positive square root. So in particular, this operator is self adjoint, so you can swing this one into that second slot. And you're left with root t star t acting on v comma root t star t acting on v. It feels like, oh, you forgot an adjoint. Retzik, Retzik, you forgot an adjoint. No, root t star t is self-adjoint. It's positive already. And that is nothing other than the square of the norm of root t star t acting on v. So the big upshot here is, let's call this fact star. The norm of tv is the same as the norm of root t star t v for all v in big v. So fine, t and root t star t are not the same map. But norm-wise, they do the same thing at least. OK, this box will be important to us shortly. Fantastic. OK, so here's the game plan. We are going to focus on this side of the picture here. So we're going to blow that up on the next page. And we're going to try to build from scratch this isometry S that we claim exists. OK, here we go. All right, so here's where we are right now. Here's V. And here's V. Here in red, is the range of T. Here in red, is the range of root t star t. These are not the same set. We have already established that. t does not equal root t star t. But if you define a map S1, by saying, all right, fine, here's what I'm going to do. Anything that's down here as an object in that set, so that would be root t star t of something. That's how you get into the range of root t star t. Let's just send it to whatever t of that something is. So the correspondence in blue for S1 is this. If 
If you want to see it in symbols, here's how S1 works. S1, acting on a thing that belongs. You know what? I don't want to put it right there. We need that space. I'll put it off to the side. <clears throat> Let's define S1, a mapping that takes inputs from the range of root t star t and produces outputs in the range of t by, okay, here's how S1 works, S1 of a thing in the range of root t star t. is T V. Okay. Now, there's a subtlety here that you can read about in the proof. It's important that this S1 is well defined. And if we scroll back up, it's possible up here that two different V's, a V and a V hat, could go to the same output. We don't know necessarily that root T star T is one to one. And if that happens, in order for S1 to make sense, it better be true that V and the doppelganger V hat also go to the same place. It can't matter how you represent the object in the range of root t star t. Wherever it came from, S1 has to do the right thing to it. So I'm just going to write this. S1 is legit and an isometry by our observation star. So S1 is working right. Okay, now let's talk about how we finish the job. So here's the move. <clears throat> S1 is actually one to one and onto. By its very definition, it's onto, and since it's an isometry, it's one to one. The only thing that can go to zero is zero. So S1 is a bijection, which means those two red blobs that you see right there, they have the same dimension. So if you make their perps, so this is classic Math 406, just classic, make the perp. So that green blob right there, that's range T perp. And this green blob right here, this is range root t star t perp. Those two green blobs have the same dimension because the red blobs do. And the direct sum of red and green is the whole space. So the difference in dimension is the dimension of the green blob. So those two green blobs have the same dimension. Now, that means you can throw down an orthonormal basis for this one. And you can throw down an orthonormal basis for this one. And they're the exact same length. The green blobs have the same dimension. Now you can make an S2. That tells you what to do with the green stuff simply by assigning basis to basis. And since those are orthonormal, S2 is an isometry. Leave that for you to verify. If you send any linear combination of the E's to the corresponding linear combination of the F's, then you're preserving norms. 
Now, once you have that S1 and that S2 working separately on the red and the green, you can glue them together to produce the miracle S, the one that makes the theorem true, this S, this one right here, we're going to build now by gluing S1 and S2 together. Okay, so let's think about how we're gonna glue those things together. That seems sort of vague math talk. Here's what that really means. Let's define S from all of V to all of V by, okay, so S is gonna act on a typical thing in V, but a typical thing in V is something from the red plus something from the green. What should we do to the red thing? Let's have it do S1 to the red thing, and let's have it do S2 to the green thing. By its very construction, by construction, <clears throat> if you do S to a typical V, well, actually not to a typical V, Let's just see what happens if we do S acting on root T star T V. This object right here, this is in the red already. That's a thing in the red. That's a thing in the range of root T star T. So that means the W inside those parentheses, this piece, is nothing. And so in this line of our calculation, this is just a S1 done to T star T acting on V. And by definition, S1 sends that to TV. So for any V in big V, this is true. And look what this says. It says T acting on V is the same as S root T star T acting on V. So T really does equal. S root T star T. Finally, that S that we built is an isometry since norm SV equals do norm squared. Norm squared S1U plus S2W. Where do those live? S1 of U, uh, that lives up here in range T. S2 of W, that lives up here in range T perp. So these two objects are perpendicular to each other. So by Pythagorean theorem, 
That's just the sum of the individual squares of the norms. S1's an already an isometry though, as far as the red blob is concerned. And S2 is already an isometry, as far as the green blob is concerned. And by Pythagorean theorem one more time, where were you in V? U lives in here. V, sorry, W lives in here. So by Pythagorean theorem, that's the square of the norm of U plus W, but what was U plus W? It was V. And that's it. We win. We built from scratch. This isometry S that does this magical trick. And all it took was believing in the positive square root of T star T and a little observation about root T star T and root, uh, sorry, root T star T and T not being the same map, but having outputs of the same norm. So in some sense, they're just a, a slight tweak from one another. What's that slight tweak? It's S. All right, we got it. That is the proof of the polar decomposition theorem. Don't lose the statement of it because of all the details. This says any linear operator is an isometry times a positive square root. Brilliant. See you next time.